Let's turn this morning to the book of Acts. Read a couple of verses there first before we move on. Acts chapter 9. First part of it here dealing with Paul's conversion. Acts 9, verses 1 through 5. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But arise, enter the city. It will be told to you what you must do. And then over in Acts 26, Paul's testimony before King Agrippa after he had been arrested. The end of uh, Acts 26, verse uh, 19, Paul has again shared his testimony. He shared with King Agrippa what has gone on on the road to Damascus, what he'd seen. And Paul testifies, he says, Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. And then finally over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul's, we know 2 Timothy was Paul's closing letter. This is shortly before his martyrdom. And as he pours out his heart, he reflects back upon his life. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray. Lord, we're so blessed to be able to gather this day. We're thankful, Lord, you have prepared a table before us. And Lord, as our hearts draw near to that table, there's a vastness to it that we touch every time. And we see a little more of you, a little more of thy greatness. And Lord, it's the same way as we come to your word. Whether we're new to your word, whether we've been in it for many years, it seems like whenever we come to your word in a, in a new way, there's a freshness to it. There's so, we see another aspect of your life. And Lord, today we would come as those hungering and thirsting after you. And we're thankful, Lord, that you have made the provision of the Holy Spirit. And we pray your Spirit would have a great freedom in all of our lives today, Lord. We're not here, as we often say, to gain knowledge. But we're here to have an encounter with you. We want to see the living word. We want the life of Christ to impact our hearts and our lives. So we offer ourselves to you this morning that you would have a great freedom, a liberty in each one of us, Lord. In your wonderful name, amen. Last October, I was asked to share a message at Harvey Cedars on redeeming the time as seen in the life of Paul. And during that time, as I looked at it, I saw three aspects that impacted Paul. And the more I considered it, I saw that it was really far beyond just this limited thing of redeeming the time and how it was some governing lessons within Paul's life. So what I'm desiring to do by the grace of God is to take that one message, expand it into three. Now sometimes that can terrify people. <laughs> but by his grace, uh, we want to be looking at it a little bit differently uh, this time, considering three points. And you know, as we read these verses, particularly in Acts chapter 9, you know, Paul had that dramatic experience. And we have to ask the question, because we're familiar with Paul's life before he was saved. Now, I'm not going to get into the calling him Saul and Paul. He's always Paul this morning, okay? 
Uh, I'll get confused if I try to do that. <laughs> so before he was saved, we know he was a great persecutor of the church. He had a great zeal. He loved the Lord, uh, but it was just misfocused. But on that day, on that road to Damascus, Paul had an encounter, and it revolutionized his life. And he was captured by the Lord after that. He was a totally changed man. And as we look at Paul in that chapter, we see how he was so intense on persecuting the way, or the followers of Jesus. And he's, as he's going on this road, all of a sudden he's knocked off of his high horse. And he has this encounter, and he looks up and he says, Who are you, Lord? And in an amazing way, as you look back in Acts chapter 9, Paul got the answer that totally revolutionized his life. When he said, Who are you? The Lord just didn't say, I am Jesus. But he went on. He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And Paul was in a moment of perplexity. He said, wow, he said, you're Jesus. <laughs> he said, but I'm not persecuting you. I'm the ones that are following you. But by the grace of God, Paul at that moment saw that when he touched the living God, he touched, when, as he touched Christ, he saw there was something more. As he touched the followers of Christ, he saw he was actually touching Christ. And when Paul talks about this heavenly vision in Acts 26, we've got to be really clear on what that is. Paul didn't encounter a teaching. Paul didn't encounter a truth. When Paul's speaking of a heavenly vision, He's not speaking of a what or a thing. He's speaking of a person. Paul saw Christ. And that's what Paul saw. Sometimes we can have a tendency to make this heavenly vision so complicated. I'm sorry. It's simple. He saw Christ. <laughs> it revolutionized his life. And that's all we need. I could sit down now. <laughs> because all we need is to have an encounter with Christ. You know, Paul had this encounter. He was going the opposite way. He was actually working against the Lord. But when he saw the living God and it captured his heart, it totally transformed his life. And he put Paul, because Paul saw that it was more than just Christ. He saw that there was this body, that there were these believers, these followers. And what Paul saw was that there was a oneness there. And one of the tragedies and the traps that we fall into is that we separate Christ from the church. We can separate Christ from the heavenly vision. Christ is the church. <laughs> for, for, just for our reference, look over at 1 Corinthians 12. Okay, these are familiar, most of the verses we'll be reading today are familiar verses. But if we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12, as Paul in this chapter, he's talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about the functioning of the church. If we look at 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. We normally would think that that would say the church, or the body, but it's Christ, because Christ is the church. And we've, we're in Christ and Christ is in us. And there's a oneness there. When these get separated, then you get into cults. If you look at the church without Christ in it, you've only got a cult. You've got a deception. And if you don't see Christ with the fullness of him and all his body and all the, that we're all one in him, there's just an individual wandering around in the desert. But the Lord, when Paul saw on this day, he saw one life. He saw the life of Christ, and it revolutionized him. And throughout his life, what he saw there of Christ and his body, Christ and the church. I'm hesitant on even using the word church today because we can separate it automatically. When we're saying church, we're speaking of that fullness of Christ as the head and his life within it. This is what Paul saw. And throughout his life, the more he had experienced Christ, that revelation of, of Christ that he had seen, it simply became fuller and fuller. There became a height to it, a depth to it. 
There was a length. There was a breadth. And he got to those times where he couldn't describe the fullness of Christ. <laughs> because there was a richness there. This is what revolutionized Paul's life. This was the heavenly vision that he had. Not a concept. Not a teaching. Not a doctrine. But a person. And in these last days, we need to come back to that person. This is what the Lord is jealous for. He's jealous for the life of His Son to be expressed and seen among the very people that He has loved. The very people that He purchased as we remembered Him at this table today. He's calling us to return to that simplicity and purity of devotion to Him. And how we've gotten it so complicated. Now, we can, as I'm saying, we, we can't, it's one life that we live. We live the life of Christ. Now, oftentimes, we talk about, oh, I have a, a church life, I've got a corporate life, I've got an individual life, I've got a work life, I've got a social. In many ways, that there's, there's an aspect of that that's true, but it's actually false. There's one life that we live. Whether we're at work, whether we're at home, whether we're at school, we're still part of the body of Christ. We're still part of the church. Now, when we gather together, there's an expression of that life together of the oneness that we have in him. But we're, we're always part of the, his body, always part of the church. And so we can distinguish aspect, various aspects of our life. But let's not fall into the trap of thinking, oh, I have an individual life and then I've got a corporate life. I've got an individual life and a church life. It's one life. <laughs> and he's called us to that life. And this is what Paul lived. Paul lived one life, and it got manifested many different ways in many different expressions. And so we're, we're looking, we're jealous that his, that one life could be lived out through us. Because after this event, Paul was a captured man. He was no longer living for himself, but he was living for him who loved him and died for him, rose again. Paul was captured by this. That's why... Paul would sing this song, Jesus, Lord, I'm captured by thy beauty. Paul had that encounter on the road to Damascus. He was captured by the beauty of the Lord. And all through his life, he would testify of that, of who the Lord is and the greatness of who the Lord is. He saw that Christ's heart was to be all in all. He saw that there was this desire within the Lord that each one of us would be conformed to the image of Christ. It's not being conformed to a way of functioning in the church. It's not being conformed to a certain this or that. But it's being conformed to the image of Christ. His life being expressed through each and every one of us. In the uniqueness of the diversity in the way he's created each one of us so wonderfully. It's great. That's one of the things I enjoy during, when a worship time is so full, because there's, there's a uniqueness. There's a breadth of the many wonderful ways that God expresses his life through us. And it's essential, well, as I said, we talk a lot about being in these last days. And it's essential in these last days that this reality uh, be recovered. A reality that goes far beyond just the truth or doctrine of the church, far beyond just talking about the church, far beyond just talking about church life or this or that, but a reality of his life being expressed. It's vital to know his, the jealousy that he has for his life to be expressed among the people of God. And it's vital to know how precious this life as expressed through the church is to him. Paul saw something of how precious this life was. He saw something of how much the, the cost that the Lord paid that we could be brought in to this glorious life. He saw something of how precious this corporate expression of his, this one life was. Look in Ephesians chapter 5. If in Ephesians chapter 5, we see Paul expressing something of God's heart here. Something of how jealous the Lord was. Paul saw something of how precious it was. In Ephesians 5, starting in 25, 
Since I'm a husband, I'll leave out the first part, and we'll just uh, start in the middle of the verse. <clears throat> That's my prerogative. <laughs> just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot, wrinkle, any such thing, but that he should be whole, but that she should be holy and blameless. Paul saw something of what the Lord was after. He saw that it was far more than just about Paul. He saw that God was desiring for the, the fullness of his, his life to be expressed. Paul encountered life and it transformed Paul's life. And I'm going to say it again. Paul didn't encounter a teaching or a doctrine. He encountered life. He encountered a person. And that changed his life. That's what changed. If we look, sat, go around at the various testimonies of what changed our life, it was the life of Christ that touched us in a very specific way at a specific moment, and we were never the same again. He might have used a book. He might have used other people. He might have used the word. Various ways he works. But what that brought us to was an encounter with Christ. And that's when we were changed. And that's when we were captured. And this is what Paul was captured by. And this is what God is so jealous for. He, he's always simply looking for his life to be expressed through the brothers and sisters. As you look at Revelation 2 and 3, those seven churches, what's he looking for? He's looking for the life. He's not judging them on how correctly they can discern doctrine, how they do this or that. He's simply looking for the life of his son expressed through those dear believers. That's what he's looking for among us in the days we're living in. So for us to encourage us in this way, I'd like for us to consider uh, not so much Paul's teaching, but Paul's life. And really, as we look at him, actually his life is his teaching. There's a testimony there. Because his Paul's teaching, it came out of life. Where did, where did Paul, all that Paul shared, when Paul said, you know, I'll be a fool for Christ, that's because he had experienced being a fool for Christ. His, what he shared it came out of his experience with the Lord. And his life reflected his teaching. His teaching and his life, there was synonymous. They were the same. There was a oneness there. And his life validated what he shared. There wasn't this separation. There wasn't a contrast. But there was, we see this together. And we said that Paul was a captured man. On that road to Damascus, he was captured. And he, Paul shares a wonderful testimony of how this impacted his life in Philippians chapter 3. If we look at Philippians 3, we see much of, uh, actually much in Philippians, there's a lot of Paul's testimony here. <clears throat> but in Philippians 3, starting in verse 4, we see how Paul is testifying here of the great encounter that he had with the Lord and how it totally transformed him. Philippians 3, start, starting in 4, he says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And actually those words still ring true today. <laughs> Paul had far more going for him than most of us have. Paul in many ways had the whole world before him, and we'll touch on that in a minute. But once he saw the Lord, all that he had, everything that, he, that was precious to him, all that was of great value according to the world's standards, the prestige, the status, totally changed. And he shares about this. <clears throat> verse, continuing in verse 5, he shares something of his Jewish heritage. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted loss and for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ. Paul, <clears throat> at this point, he was captured. He once desired and was seeking all the things of the world, not only the secular world, but the religious world. And he had far more uh, attributes and success than many of his peers. As you look around at Paul, this, if we stop and think about him, in the days he was living in, there was three main influences in the world. There was the Greek society, there was the Roman uh, Empire, and there was the Jewish religion. These were the three main forces during this day and time. And if you look at those, Paul had all three of them. As to the Greek culture, he was born in Tarsus. So he was brought up and had the Greek education and culture. And we, it's an amazing thing that many cultures come and go. But we can actually still see today the evidence of the Greek culture and the influence on education in life today. I'm not talking about the ruins in Athens. <laughs> I'm talking about the influence it has among society today. That's the power of that culture, that humanistic, it's called humanism today, but the, the power and how it's, it's, it's continued on. And Paul had all of that right before him. He was also born a Roman citizen. We know how valuable it was to be a, a Roman citizen, that some even paid for it. But Paul was born into it, and this gave him a legal privilege. It gave him a status in society, that he was just a, a layer above many others who were part of this empire, because he was born a Roman. So at, at times we see him exercising those rights as a Roman citizen, other times he doesn't. But we see when, as led by the Spirit, he, he uses those. He had this right at his grasp. And then as far as his religious heritage as a Jew, he had one of the, the highest heritages, heritages of any because he was, as you can see that he was, his family was a very practicing Jew. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He wasn't a Hellenist. We could say that Paul was a thoroughbred. He, a Hellenist was kind of a mixture. But he was, Paul was a thoroughbred. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And even he, he had kept his identity. Many by this time had lost it, but he knew he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And he was, his family was so committed to the Jewish tradition that they named, of the tribe of Benjamin, they named him after the most famous person within this tribe, Saul. Wow. You know, he had, a, what a heritage he had. He studied under Gamaliel. He had the best Jewish education going. He was a Pharisee. And it's for the zeal, he was a persecutor. Paul had all this going. Paul was a man of his time. He was a man of his age. And many historians say that probably Paul, if he had not have been captured by the Lord, we would be reading about him in the history books. He was so powerful at this time. But once he encountered the Lord, there was a great transformation and he was totally, totally changed. Paul literally was in a place to gain the whole world. Most of we're not in that place. <laughs> we could gain a little bit here, a little bit there, but even these little bits become so powerful to us. But Paul, once he saw Christ, once he saw the person of Christ, all of that became as nothing to him. Paul was, he was a great specimen of mankind. But then once he encountered the Lord, he counted it all rubbish. And now he's not counting, remember, he's not just counting the so-called bad things. Oh, this, I'll put this sin aside, put this bad, I won't cuss, smoke, or chew anymore. No. He's up there, he's talking about the good things. None of, many of these things, they're, they're not evil. This is who he was. But he put these, he, when he saw Christ, everything was out the window, window. Because sometimes in our lives, good becomes the enemy of better. And we look into the world and we say, oh, that's good, that's, that's not harmful. But there's, a, there's something better. There's Christ. And this is what was it captured Paul. And so the question we have to ask ourselves and our hearts and our lives, have we had this encounter with the Lord? Have we really come to that place of having this personal encounter with Him that we, as we look upon the things that we value, 
Have we counted them all rubbish? And I love verse 5 as you look back at Philippians 3. Because I believe Paul and the Holy Spirit, he puts in some extra words just so that there are no loopholes for us. He says at the beginning of verse, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 8. He says, more than that, he says, I count all things, not most things, not some things. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing, having that intimate personal relationship with the Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He, he admitted, he said, I suffered the loss. He's not trying to paint a rosy picture. He said, it cost me something. These things were of value to me. But when I saw Christ, I was willing to suffer the loss of them. You know, sometimes we think, oh, you see the Lord, oh, it just goes away. No, there's a process within us. There can be a suffering, because that meant something to you. <laughs> and, but all of a sudden, you see something better. And you're, you're, you're transitioning out of that into the Lord. This is what Paul says. He said, and he counts them all but, but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That's a perspective there. The things that were at the top are already at the bottom. He's cleaned house. He's had a spring cleaning. And he's come in and he's, he's a whole new perspective on life. And the things that we value in the world, well, how are we handling them today? Whether it's our career, whether it's our education, our, our prestige at work, uh, whether it's sports, whether it's entertainment, it can go on and on. Have, has it been counted rubbish to us? Or do we still say, Lord, I, I love you, but this is still nice. Uh, Stella and I, we, we read through the scriptures every year. Uh, and so we started back at Genesis. And in, we were reading the story of Abraham and Lot. And there's a little phrase in Lot that it really jumped out at me. I want to look at it a little more. Uh, and it shows, uh, it, reflect, it showed me my heart at times. When thou, Abraham and Lot were getting ready to divide the land, and, they, Lot, and Abraham said, go ahead, Lot, you choose. And Lot looked out and he says, oh, this looks like the garden of God. This looks like Egypt. Yeah. He saw both. He saw God and the, he, there was a mixture there. there was, he liked them. He, he, he knew enough to know, oh, these are the things of God. Oh, but look, these are the things of Egypt. And I want them both. And he made that choice. You know, Abraham chose the Lord. And the Lord gave him a rich inheritance. Lot, he said, oh, this is good. He said, Lord, I'm choosing this for you. And I'll, I'll take Egypt too. And so often we choose the Lord, but we say, oh, I like this in the world too, and I like that, and I like that. And we try to coexist. There's no peaceful coexistence between these two kingdoms. It will destroy us. And Paul saw this, and he gave it all up. The, the rich, he just, he, he just let it all go. And have we counted it all rubbish? When Paul had this encounter with the Lord, he, he, when he had this encounter, he was with the brethren for a while, and, and then he goes out to the desert. Goes out to the desert of Arabia just simply to be alone with the Lord, to have that quiet time with him. And during this time as he was alone and set apart with the Lord, all of a sudden as the Spirit of God was opening to him, all the scriptures, Paul knew the whole Old Testament by his training, and all of a sudden as he was looking through Genesis, He's starting to see Christ. He's seeing God's heart. As he looks at the tabernacle, he sees us speaking of the fullness of what Christ desires, a house, a habitation. As he looks through the prophets, he's saying, oh, this is who Isaiah prophesied of. This is who Jeremiah prophesied. Everything was Christ. That's what he saw. He saw the living Christ throughout the scripture. Oh, you know, Paul had a great transformation. As he was in the word, the Lord opened his eyes. It was very similar to like the disciples on that road to Emmaus. Remember after our Lord had been uh, crucified and rose again, some of the disciples were, had left and were walking on that road to Emmaus and the Lord came alongside of them and they didn't know it was the Lord at that time. He, but they, as they were sharing and talking with him, he started opening their eyes to all the things that were in the scripture. And they were, he showed them that through all Moses and the prophets, the things concerning himself. Would, again, he wasn't introducing them to new teaching. He introduced them to himself. 
And that's what transformed them. That's what Job had. I'd heard about you, but now my eyes see you. And have we had this? Do we know him or do we just know about him? Paul had this reality experience before he knew about the Lord. He had a knowledge of God, a knowledge of the Lord, but he didn't really know him. But he came to know the living God. He had this eye-opening experience, and he saw as he was, had his eyes opened that this, he had this experience of encountering the very living God. And in that place of quietness, that place of being set aside, he learned his first lesson. He saw the necessity of having that intimate, personal relationship with the Lord. And that's what we'd like to consider today. That Paul saw the absolute necessity of having this intimate, personal relationship with him. Lord willing, the, the next couple of weeks, we'll look at the other two lessons. Uh, we'll look at the intimate relationship today. Next week, we'll look at Paul had this insatiable desire for the Lord. And the third time we'll look at Paul saw that in Christ was one with an infallible life. There was an infallible Christ there. But Paul, as he came to the Lord, he first saw that there, that there was this absolute need for this intimate, daily, personal, you keep going on and on how to try to describe it, relationship with the Lord. And it wasn't just a starting point of a relationship. It was something that governed his life throughout his whole being. The whole time he was on the, this earth, he was there and he was growing and he was going closer to the Lord, knowing him in that fuller way. Last week when our, our brothers were here for the youth time, they referred to this as a secret life, as a hidden life. We use many ways to describe it. And it's actually one of the challenges of sharing on it. Because I, as I share this morning on the, an, having an intimate relationship with the Lord, Everybody says amen. We all agree. But when we're honest, do we have it? Why don't we? Paul, and this is why we're looking at Paul to see, can he encourage us? Can he help us to have this consistent uh, life with the Lord that his life would be expressed? Because throughout Paul's life, we see how he has these encounters. And each of these encounters, he comes to know the Lord and that greatness and the goodness of himself. As we look at the book of Acts, we, the next time we see Paul uh, is when during the church of Antioch in the Acts chapter 11, you know, Barnabas has gone there. And Barnabas realizes what the Lord's doing. And Barnabas says, uh, I, I need some help. And so in a spirit of fellowship, he remembers because he, he had heard Paul, what Paul had gone through and what Paul was, the Lord was showing Paul. So he went and found Paul, searched him out, brought him there. And what did they do there for that, that time? They, they were teaching, yes. But they were there and they were allowing the life of Christ to be expressed. And to me, the wonderful testimony of what Paul taught and what Barnabas taught was they were first called Christians at Antioch. And who called them the Christians? It was the world. The world looked upon these ones. And they didn't say, oh, look at the little Paulinians. Look at the little Barsnippians, or however you would say, Barnasipidian. <laughs> but they saw, what they saw was the life of Christ expressed. And they said, look at all these little Christ. That's what the world saw. They saw a life expressed. Because that's what God is after. And this is what Paul and Barnabas were imparting to them. Not so much the teaching and the doctrines and all that, but the life being expressed in a fullness. And praise God, as you continue in looking at the book of in the church of Antioch, if you come to Acts 13, it talks about how the, the ones there were, in Acts 13 too, they were ministering to the Lord. This is the life of fellowship. This is the life of an intimate relationship. It's you're your ministering to the Lord. And then when the Lord spoke, they heard him. They were in a place to hear the Lord's voice. They weren't so distracted. They weren't occupied with other things. But as they were ministering to him, then they weren't ministering to him expecting to hear. They, they just loved him and they were ministering to him. And God spoke to him and said, set apart to me, Saul and Barnabas, for this work. They knew him. They knew his voice. 
And it's critical in these last days that we're living in that we know this voice. We know his voice. We know his ways. And we know what he's after. Because if we don't know his voice, there's enough warnings in the scriptures about the last days that a couple of things will happen. If we don't know his voice, if we don't know his ways, we'll miss him. We can be led astray by false prophets, false teachers, or we'll miss him because he moves this way and we have a concept, wait a minute, you don't, God doesn't work like that. Yeah, so we can, we, can, we can miss him or be led astray. But we want to, and Jesus knew this. And so if you look at the end of the Gospels, what was, he was encouraging them in many ways to, to stay on the alert, to get to, to know me, know my voice, know my ways and my heart. And this is you know, what Paul, through the difficulties of his life and through all the trials of his life, he was able to continue faithful to the Lord of knowing him. The Lord tells us that many will come in my name. There'll be many counterfeits. Christ is here. Christ is there. In the midst of all the voices and confusion, are we going to know his voice? There's a, a dear sister we've known for many years uh, out of uh, the Bay Area in California. And I always, uh, I, this happened years ago, but it just rings so fresh to my heart because we were, she was taking us around San Francisco one day. And she said, do you hear that bird? And we said, the bird? No, well, it turns out at the school, the university she was in, she was studying birds. I mean, whoever studies birds? But some, you know, people study all sorts of things. Some people even study accounting or whatever. But it's just it's people studying birds. And so, but the thing of, she said, do you hear that bird? We said, no, I just hear music and noise and cars and horns and buses. And she said, now stop and listen. Put your ear, listen over this way. And you just kind of strain in your ear. And she said, you hear it saying? Then all, she said, now focus there a little more. And all of a sudden you started hearing this voice. Her ears were trained to hear the voice of birds. And wherever she went, she could hear the birds. You know, and it, it, it rung a spiritual lesson to my heart of, do I hear God's voice? Or do I get so caught up by all the noise of the world, even the counterfeits of, his, of teaching, saying, this is Christ, this is Christ. Do I really know his voice? And can I hear his voice? Do I tra her, she trained herself. She had a love for birds. <laughs> We, the Lord's calling us to respond to his love, that that love for him, would, that our ears of our hearts would be open and trained in such a way that in the midst of the chaos and disaster and everything of these days we're living in, we would know that voice and be able to follow it. Because if we, if we don't know him and God moves one way and it's not a way that we're expecting, we might miss him. We shared this uh, last year uh, when I shared on the book of Habakkuk. The Lord told Habakkuk, you know, I'm going to do something that, that you're not going to believe. And, and God worked in, in a really strange way. It, it appeared like using the enemy. But God was using that. And if, uh, if we don't know God's voice and are able to respond, we, can get such, we have such concepts of how he would act that we miss him. Remember in the, in the book of Acts, again, you have Peter at the house of Simon. And he's uh, on the rooftop there. And Peter was a very righteous Jew. And as he's on that rooftop, he has this vision of this sheet coming down. And everything in it is unholy. And it, the Lord's lowering the sheet. And Pete, Peter, Pete, I guess I shouldn't call him Pete. Uh, Peter, out of respect for my older brother there. Peter, as he as this sheet comes, he says, oh, Lord, I'm so righteous. I am so holy. <laughs> the Lord knows who he is, but you know, I, I've never eaten any of this. And he goes through that three times. But the wonderful thing about that story is that when there was that knock on the door, Peter responded, and he went to the unholy Gentiles. Peter learned the lesson. He had a concept of how God works, and God shattered it. And, Peter, and the Lord used Peter to open that door there to the Gentiles at the house of Cornelius. Praise God, Peter was teachable at that moment, correctable. And the same with so often, one of the things that is so misrepresented today is the Holy Spirit. 
there's so many thoughts and theories and opinions and everything on the Holy Spirit, and we try to it, we, our definitions end up narrowing and limiting the Spirit. But I always think back on Elijah, how when he was on that in that cave, how when the Lord was speaking to him and the wind came by and the fire and the earthquake and the Lord says, I'm not in any of that. I'm that still small voice. So there are times when the Lord is a still small voice. But I don't think we need to take that story and apply it universally. There are times when there was a great wind, like on the day of Pentecost, and that was the Holy Spirit. There are times when the Lord is like a mighty wind, there's a times when the Lord is like that mighty fire. There's times when he's like a mighty earthquake, and he's in the earthquake. That earthquake set Paul free from that prison in Philippi, and the jailer was saved, and the church there was birthed out of an earthquake. You know, so we see how we don't, sometimes we can, uh, depending on our own preferences related to the Holy Spirit, we can say, oh, the Spirit's a still, small voice. You're getting too loud. Or else we get the crowd over here who's, oh, the spirit is wind and fire and earthquakes. and well, You're too quiet over here. It's not, it's not an either-or question. It's an inclusive. The spirit works as he chooses. We just read in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, about that wind moving. And, and God directs the spirit the way he chooses. And at times he's a mighty wind. At times he's a still, small voice. And do we, but are we in a, the, the question for us is are we in a place, do we have this relationship with the Lord that we know Him such that when He moves this way or that way, we know that's the Lord? Or do we have such preconceived ideas and concepts that we actually limit Him and then miss Him? God moves on. It's tragic as you continue on in Acts. If you look at Acts 13, Paul is out there declaring the glorious gospel. But they're one. he's telling of the death and resurrection of our Lord and sharing the gospel in a glorious way. But many of the Jews there, they have such a concept of the Lord that they don't, they're, not, they're not open and they reject the very word of God. Look at Acts 13, uh, 27. In Acts 13, 27, it, it speaks of those who, who they didn't respond to the Lord in life. 1327, for those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him, that's Christ, nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, actually fulfill those condemning him. You know, they, had the pro they had the word of God presented to them every week. They had the prophets speaking to them. And Christ was there in their midst. And yet they didn't see him because they had such a religious concept of this is the way God works. And we can unconsciously develop those concepts and totally miss the Lord. This is why Paul, as, he, as we look at his life, we see he had this such intimate personal relationship with the Lord that he, would, he knew his voice. When the Lord said, go here, he went there. When the Lord said, no, Paul, I don't want you to preach right now, which sounds strange. I, we would think the Lord would want Paul to preach all the time. But we know there was a time the Lord said, He said, the Holy Spirit told me, don't preach here. Don't preach there. That sounds strange. But Paul, he knew the Lord in such a way that he just he obeyed and he kept going. Do we know the Lord in such a way like that? Does the Lord, has He captured us like He captured Paul? And this is what... You know, the Lord is after. Because just as these heard that scriptures read every Sabbath, brethren, we've had the scriptures shared with us a whole bunch. Every Lord's Day, every conference, many retreats, over and over again, we have had the word of God profusely poured forth within our midst over these years. And do we, but do we know the living word of God? Do we know that person? We can hear it every day, every conference. This is why it is so vital in the last days that we know this. That we can, that because the Lord says there's going to be those false prophets. There's going to be these false signs. But Paul had such an intimate relationship with the Lord that he could distinguish and he could discern. Paul, when, when things came in, like when things came into Galatia and there was another gospel there, Paul immediately said, that's another gospel. Why, why are you listening to that? You've grown dull. Why are you getting caught up by this other gospel? 
When this heresy came into Colossae, Paul could discern. He knew the truth. He knew the reality. And he said, don't, don't fall prey to this. And with the, among the Corinthians, Paul said, you, got, you need to grow up and be able to distinguish between the flesh and the spirit. This is just all carnal. This is the spirit. You need to be able to distinguish. This is what one who knows the Lord and is growing and has this relationship, he could distinguish. Paul could distinguish false prophets. He could distinguish those false messiahs. And it's critical in these last days that we be able to distinguish or we'll get led astray. It's tragic how throughout history, even going on today, so many ones that we know that know the Lord, there can be a false, con a false prophet come in, a false teacher, and it, it can sound so beautiful because there's always an element of truth mixed in there that snaps you. And they're led astray and we say, how could that brother, if we've known so many, how could they get into that? Uh, how could they be? You know, I, the one thing that amazes me is how believers that are going on in the Lord go back to the Old Testament and fall into practicing all the Judaism. Uh, it's like, come on, let's wake up. You know? <laughs> but we, we, we can get trapped if we, look, we, if we start looking for knowledge and experience and this and that, and we, we get away from that intimate, personal daily time relationship with him. This is what he's after. This is what he's so jealous for. And Paul, again, if we look back in Philippians again, in Philippians 1, Paul is encouraging them in this way to, to really have this discerning heart within them, to be able to distinguish between these things. Look at Philippians 1, verses 9 and 10. This is called discerning love. It's tragic today how love has been so misrepresented. Today we confuse love and sentimentality. Ooh, it's so sweet. You know, it's, that's, that's another topic. We won't go there. But, we'll, but if you look at these verses, and they sound strange to us when we think of it as love. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. So they have love. They have it. That, that's great. He said, you've got it. But I want you to abound more and more in the real knowledge, that experiential knowing knowledge of me and all discernment, that you may grow, that your love may abound in real knowledge and all discernment. And why is it? In verse 10, so that you may be able to approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. A New American Standard says, approve the things that are excellent. In other translations, start verse 10, that you can distinguish between the things that are different. There's a, there's a life of Christ within us. There's that love of Christ that is able to distinguish. This is of the Lord. This is not. This is, we don't often equate knowledge and discernment with love. We think love is blind and... Gets us into trouble at times. But here he's saying, look, in these last days that you're living in, there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be false teachings coming. There's going to be this. There are many things coming in my name. And you've got to be able to distinguish between what's of me and what's not of me. And the only way you can do that is by knowing me. <laughs> and so we need to, this is why he keeps coming back to this. Paul knew this because he had this relationship about him. And it's tragic today. We have to ask ourselves the question, are, are we substituting a knowledge of him for a relationship with him? Are we substituting just knowing about him for that personal relationship with him? We want the quick answers. We want all the easy answers. But do we, are we really there taking that time to know him? Today, we're, we're in such a hurry. There's, there's such the, the instancy of life. We don't have time to be quiet, to be still. We got, there's so many distractions. We, even, we try to have our quiet time, and our, our cell phone beeps, and we say, excuse me, Lord, I need to answer this text. You know, we, we can't even put our cell phones aside during this quiet time. And it's just there's so many distractions, but the Lord is wanting us to to really come into this place of knowing him and being quiet before him. And as we, as we do this, we, there's, there's a life that he's wanting to form within us. 
what happens in these days where we, we're substituting knowledge of him for a relationship with him. It's so often we hear, well, I read this. Brother so-and-so says this. So-and-so says this or so-and-so says that. And when people share, it's like you get in a book report. Uh, we're not here to get book reports. We're here to hear what Christ is and who, what, what's he speaking to us. And, you know, we're thankful for the great heritage we have. Uh, it's a richness in the heritage. But are we, what are we passing on? Is it, has it become reality to us or is it just secondhand food? Oh, I read this. This might be good for you. Is it, is it really entered into our hearts, become real to us? Have we chewed upon it and then passing it on in life? So it's so easy just to pass on knowledge. We can let knowledge go. And in Daniel, one of the characteristics of the last days, Daniel says a knowledge will increase. And we see that going on. And what happens is we as believers, we're substituting this great knowledge. There's such a heritage we have. Will you go out to the books here? I'll do an advertisement for a few minutes here. And pick up any of those great books out there, which are a wonderful price and you should help buy them. But they, they, there's a richness there, and we feed upon it. But it's stimulating us. The object is to bring us to Christ in a fuller way. And, and would we get, help us to get through this and able to really come into entering this in a, in a wonderful way? You know, the Lord, when he was upon earth, he encountered this. Look, look back over at the Sermon on the Mount. In a minute, it will... Uh, Look at Matthew chapter 5. There's two little phrases that are used throughout this chapter. And they're a great contrast. The Lord is sharing often through Matthew 5 the, the teachings of, from God of the Old Testament. If you look at in the two phrases I want to contrast is in like verse 21 and 22. 21 starts off, says, you have heard. And then it talks about not committing murder. But what does 22 start with? But I say to you. You've heard, but I say to you. 27, you've heard. 28, but I say to you. 33, again, you've heard, but I say to you. Down at 38, you've heard, but I say to you. And it goes on in 43, you've heard, but I say to you. And we've heard much, but God is saying to us. What's he speaking to us? That's what he's after in these last days. Hearing his voice, knowing his voice, entering into this personal, intimate relationship with him that we can make it through to the end and not be uh, distracted, not be knocked out of the race, but not relying upon others to feed us, but allowing the Lord to feed us every day, day in and day out. This is why it's so essential. That to, to draw apart unto him. And it, when I were talking about having this intimate, personal relationship with him, I'm talking far more than just a quiet time in the morning. Yes, that's part of it. Okay. But it goes beyond. It's a life. It's then that has that equipped us for that day, that throughout the day there's a consciousness of him. There's an abiding in him. There's an awareness, an alertness to the spirit. No matter if we're at work, we're taking care of kids, we're in school, whatever we're doing, there's a, there's a consciousness of him um, and being led and, and strengthened in him. This is what the brothers shared last week as they talked about David. He was a man after God's own heart. And he... He had this hidden secret fellowship, the, the, the preciousness that we, we get a glimpse into David's personal, intimate relationship with the Lord through the Psalms. I mean, the, the Psalms are simply a testimony of David's relationship with the Lord, of how he knew him. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> that, and, and that is, a, there was an intimacy there. There's a reality there, not a concept, not just a theory. And he goes on and on. He says, the Lord is my rock. The Lord's my strength. The Lord's my shield. On and on. One thing have I desired. He wanted to know him more and more. And this is what is, so the Lord is after and jealous for us in this day and time. And as, we, as we're starting a new year, would, would we, in a, maybe in a right way, set a resolution? I hate saying that, but <laughs> you can stone me afterwards. But have a desire within our hearts. Herb's already throwing the stones. <laughs> so. <laughs> but we could see, see this call back 
to this intimate relationship. And I guess one of the questions I have is, is this too simple for us? Do we want something more? It's just, um, that's what I mentioned earlier. There's a challenge of sharing this because we all agree <laughs> that we should. <laughs> Uh, we agree we need this daily intimate, but, but we don't, and somehow we come up short. Um, but how was Paul able to maintain this? You know, and one of the things I see in Paul's life was that he was undistracted. He really did literally count all things as loss. He put aside every, he didn't allow, uh, you know, sometimes we say, well, I, I've, got an extra, I've got a free hour here, I can do this. I think when Paul had that moment of freedom, there was a choice he made. He said, oh, i got a free hour. I can get to know Jesus this much more. He had many desires. I mean, if you look at Paul's heritage, uh, Paul was an ambitious man. And he was interested in many things. He was exposed to many things. He wasn't some little naive guy, uh, sheltered. He had the whole world open before him. Had it, and he said, I don't want any of it. And tragically today, so many of us, we say, well, I don't want most of it. <laughs> I still want my Yankees. <laughs> you know, they got to win the World Series. But I've got I've to come to the place of counting the Yankees as rubbish. You know, so. But we see how in all of this, the Lord, he's, he's calling us. And it's really a heart cry of love to prepare us in these last days. Paul, as I said, he was, he was undistracted, and he, he was really captured. And even to use um, the Lord Jesus' words, Paul would have said, I can do nothing apart from my Father. I don't think Paul had any confidence in himself. He said, I can do nothing. And as Paul writes about Romans 12 of being that daily living sacrifice. Again, that wasn't a teaching of Paul. That was his experience of life. Every day he was offering himself as a free will offering to the Lord. Lord, today I'm offering myself to you to be conformed to your image. When Paul writes in Corinthians about having to die daily, again, that's not a, just a neat little phrase or theory. Paul literally died daily to his own selfish wants, his own desires, to the good things in life. He put them aside. He died. He went, allowed the cross to work in him so there was one thing that he desired. We see this later on in Philippians, and we'll touch on it next week, Lord willing. But Paul, there was one thing that Paul was jealous for. He was pressing on to know Christ in a fuller and greater way. And out of this, as being this captured, out of this intimate relationship... It created within Paul this insatiable desire for Christ. And that's what we'll look at next week. But I really want us, uh, if we can, just during the, the times that we have every day, just would we be jealous to know him in a fuller and greater way and come into this intimate relationship with him. He's called us. We see that this table is a very intimate time. We share it with many. And so we see what he's calling us to. Not just to know about him, but to really know him. This is what prepares us to be able to finish the race and continue on and to hasten his return. So let's, we'll stop here for today and let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that as we look through scriptures, we see these ones that were captured by you. We see a David saying one thing. We see a Mary sitting at your feet, you sharing one thing is necessary. We see a Paul after one thing. But this thing is, it's not a thing, it's a person. Paul was captured by you. He had a personal encounter with you. And I believe every, throughout his life, he continued to have those personal encounters with you. And Lord, we uh, really do pray that you would be searching our hearts. Were there things in there that, uh, are, 
that are not of you, where there are things that we're counting of value. Lord, show us more of yourself, that in, light, in your light, in the perspective of who you are, of, who you, of what you're calling us to, we could come to that place of counting all things as rubbish for the excellency of knowing you and being prepared and being that testimony that you're calling us to be in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.